I take great pleasure in announcing tonight's speaker, Dr. Matthew Knight from National Museum Scotland. Um, Matthew is the senior curator of Prehistory, who is responsible for Copper Age and the Bronze Age collections. And the title of his talk this evening is Sacrifice, Scrap or Something Else, Practices of Metalwork Deposition in Late Bronze Age, Britain and Ireland. So over to you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, I'm delighted to be presenting as part of this series. Um, a bit of uh, my background is uh, I've been curator at the National Museum Scotland for about five years now. And before that, I was doing a PhD in Southwest England. And uh, the thing that holds my fascination is this practice of metalwork deposition that we see in the Bronze Age, which is where uh, a whole variety of objects are gathered and um, placed in the ground. Uh, and this includes axes and uh, ornaments and weapons and uh, all manner of things. And some of them are placed in particular places in the landscape, others are sunk into water. So tonight I'm going to um, take you through the sorts of things that we see, some of the past interpretations and uh, some of the new directions we're going in and studying this, particularly in the late Bronze Age when we see quite a lot of this material being placed in the ground. So uh, my aim is to show you lots and lots of pretty pictures, tell you lots of nice stories about objects and, um, and hopefully bring it to some sort of conclusion about what it all means um, at the end of this. To set the picture for you, um, we're dealing with uh, what's conventionally called the Late Bronze Age uh, within Britain and Ireland. This is a period at around, a thou uh, around 1100 um, to 800 BC um, in the context of the, uh, Kilmartin. Uh, the kind of heyday of the Glen is around the early Bronze Age at the beginning of the uh, second millennium BC. And this is about a thousand years after that um, and predates the conventional Iron Age and about a thousand years before the Romans. And by this point, metal in the form of gold and bronze has been in use for around 1500 years. It's used to make um, objects like spears and swords and shields, as well as axes, woodworking tools, um, and ornaments like jewellery, bracelets, neck rings, and so on. Um, during the Late Bronze Age, uh, you've got bronze that's being made from an alloy of copper and tin and a little bit of lead. Uh, the tin is probably sourced from Cornwall um, or similar um, similar sources, perhaps in northwestern France or um, maybe even Germany. Uh, and copper is predominantly coming from continental Europe and gold is, seems to be from a, a whole manner of places. So it's quite a well-connected well um, well time. There's a lot of trade and exchange of materials and, of and metalworking is quite well developed. And of course, it's happening alongside a range of other crafts that um, make for a really, a really dynamic um, set of communities. These, these are people well-versed in making stone tools, pottery, and a range of organics and textiles. Um, it's, uh, it's predominantly a community of farmers. This is quite a settled community, usually in small villages of roundhouses. There's extensive field systems across different areas. We've got occasional conflict. The, uh, by the late Bronze Age, the sword is a well-developed item and swords are really the first items in human histories that have no other function other than killing another person. Um, so what your um uh, so we know that conflict is is probably happening in in some um dedicated fashion uh and we also have the beginning of fortifications very early hill forts uh, ramparts and so on um but it's by no means out and out war all the time and um burial practices are quite fleeting at this time we have very little evidence of of the dead at this point so we're not finding mass graves that suggest widespread conflict in, in Britain at this time. And most of our evidence comes from fortifications and, and weapons. And it's all um, 
and, and as we increasingly get more ephemeral more away from the from the uh the concrete archaeological evidence we do know that there are a range of belief systems that um, must have been in place at this time and they're probably um we see this through monumental architecture um, some forms of burial monument as well as uh, depositional practices and this all suggests a link between people and uh, cosmological beliefs the sun the sky the moon as well as uh, intimate interactions with the with the landscape um, certain prominent areas and also notably water um, and this is often expressed through depositional practices so this is a bit of scene setting for you it gives you a sense of the world in which of what i'm going to be talking about um, is, is happening in um, so the big question that um, focuses attention when we're approaching this topic is often why were things buried i just touched on the idea of different belief systems and usually it's this idea that things are being buried in accordance with um, some sort of um, sacrifice for instance um, or there's also the viewpoint that some of this material is being abandoned as scrap no longer needed it so you it's often seen in form of in the form of this kind of dichotomy where um, artifacts are being buried perhaps as offering to gods offerings to the land or else they're just being abandoned and we still um, rely quite heavily on ideas that were developed in the, the 19th century so about 200 years ago where items might be defined by whether they're votive or ritual whether they're the um de deposit a personal deposits a personal deposit um maybe they are the stock of a trader or a founder a metal workers hoard and this is often defined by uh, often how complete and how nice the objects are. The nicer the objects, the more likely it is that it's ritual, the more uh, broken up and bashed up the objects, the more likely it is to be considered scrap. Um, a lot of my work has focused on uh, how we might go beyond this. And I think this preoccupation with why things are being buried often um, distracts us from the archeological evidence, which is most apparent. And that is how, uh, that is how were things buried. Um, this is the um, this is the very material evidence that archaeologists recover from the ground. The first thing we can see is how were these things treated, where were they placed in the landscape, um, and, and a whole number of other questions uh, can be answered uh, and analysed through approaching the how of depositions rather than the why. Um, and it's through understanding some of these treatments that we can get towards um, why things were buried. So I'm going to take the approach of, um, as I'm talking as part of the Kilmartin uh, Museum Evening Talk series, I'm going to start off looking at Argyll and Butte as a region, expand out to Scotland, Britain and Ireland over the course of the next uh, half an hour, 40 minutes or so. and. I'm going to focus very much on hordes, and this is groups or accumulations of objects that are buried in one place. It's, they're generally considered to be closed deposits, and they comprise a whole range of items. And we see these hordes of items being deposited en masse across Europe in their thousands. This is a really, really widespread practice, and um, it's worth exploring it at both a regional and a much and, and a much larger level to, to fully get to grips with the variety and also some of the nuances of this practice as well. So from Argyle and Butte, and bear in mind, we're dealing with modern definitions of, of areas. So I'm very much confined by what we now consider to be a region. But as you can see on the map, it actually covers quite a few islands off the west coast of Scotland as well. Um, and there's about nine hordes we know of dating uh, to around the late Bronze Age from Argyll and Butte and uh, as well as a smattering of individual items, axes, spearheads and swords from a range of different contexts and found in a lot of different circumstances. So I'm going to start with uh, the so-called Torren Horde. Um, this is um, a collection of objects uh, that were found across two occasions uh, initially two spearheads and a socketed gouge 
that is this uh, object that you see in the center of the picture here. You've got a spearhead on the right hand side. Um, those those two objects plus an additional spearhead that no longer survives, they were found uh, in, um, in the late 1800s while digging for a ferret of all things. And then this, um, this site was reinvestigated later on. And uh, the remaining objects that you see on the screen here, a couple of rings, a knife and three ax heads. These were found in what was referred to as a little bit of a rock shelter. Um, the actual location is, is fairly inaccessible. It's quite high up on a, on a slope um, beneath, beneath a crag. And it seems that objects kind of slipped out of what was probably some sort of um, rock cavity or constructed shelter. Um, and it, it, uh, the fine spot is, um, overlooks, it sits at the um, north end of the Kilmartin Glen, um, at, um, overlooking a small loch and called Anloden uh, on the edge, south edge of Loch Hoare. Um, this hoard is generally considered would generally be considered to represent uh, a merchant's hoard of some kind, you know, a trader's stock in items. But it's actually quite a quite an eclectic mix of objects. It's uh, you know, it's got one spearhead, it's got one knife, one woodworking tool, three axes. It's not really a stock of material. And it also shows, uh, some of the objects show signs of use. And you can see this is the ed cutting edge of a one of the axes. And there are lots of little striations that run horizontally across the edge of the axe. And this is indicative of sharpening and perhaps use wear. So these are objects that have been buried in quite a an awkward location to reach, but quite a prominent uh, visually striking location. Um, and they're also comprising used objects. So um, there's quite a there's quite a lot more going on with this hoard than simply a, uh, a, a singular interpretation might, might offer us. Uh, moving swiftly on, uh, the other quite um, quite intriguing hoard uh, from uh, from the region of Argyll and Butte is this discovery, uh, is this metal detecting discovery from 2014 from the Isle of Coal, the south end of the Isle of Coal. And uh, a metal detectorist, Kenny McIntyre, uh, was detecting on, on this land, identified um, a couple of what he believed to be Bronze Age weapons and reported these to the Treasure Trove Unit and also National Museums Scotland. Um, who responded by going out and excavating. And what you see here are the remain are the broken fragments of at least two swords, as well as five spearheads and one knife. And as you can see, almost all of it is bent, broken, snapped in half in some way. Very much what would be conventionally referred to as, as scrap. Um, because uh, the detectorist uh, had identified more signals in the ground, but had shown fantastic restraint in not digging these signals. Uh, he called in the archeologist, uh, my predecessor, Trevor Cowie, and um, a former treasure trove unit officer, Natasha Ferguson, and they went out and investigated a series of signals in what was, um, uh, what is probably a reclaimed wetland area. It was probably quite boggy during the late Bronze Age. And what, these um, what these investigations were able to show was, as you can see from all these all these flags that you see on the on your left hand on the left hand side of your screen, these all represent metal detecting signals. Not all of them are Bronze Age metalwork; some of them are lumps of iron, but they're quite well spread out. And so um, Natasha and Trevor excavated small areas around these signals, digging down and recovered. Uh, a variety of Bronze Age metalwork. And usually what, we, what we're seeking to find when we undertake these sorts of excavations is some evidence of, hu uh, of human-made context, you know, maybe a pit that these objects were once sat in or a ditch or something like that. And what was intriguing about these, this discovery is that each of these objects seemed to sit in what was natural subsoil. They seem to be suspended at different depths, at different heights. And it's speculated that actually these objects 
uh, were probably sunk in to a, wet, a watery location in the late Bronze Age across this wider area. And there's in fact a, a nice little rocky outcrop nearby that um, might have been the launching pad for throwing these things into, into, into the marsh. And what's even more significant is that we've got, um, is because these objects are, are broken um, in lots of different ways, we can say something about the way that they were broken. And this is based on uh, various experiments that I've done and others have done, where it's not quite so easy to just get a Bronze Age sword and just snap it in half. Uh, the, by far the easiest way to do this is to heat up the metal and this makes uh, the bronze quite brittle because of the, the composition of it. And then it can become much easier to snap or, or hit with a blunt object. And that breaks it into lots of different pieces. And from this perspective, if we're seeing um, these freshly fragmented bits of metal being launched into a, a cold watery place, adds a certain performative element to, to what's going on here, um, which, obviously takes us into the realm of uh, realms of speculation but it also adds to this biography of what is happening to these objects these are being deliberately broken before they're being placed into these areas as and it's quite hard to argue that these are just scrap pieces as a result of that especially when we consider that they're spread over an area a spread of metalwork might normally be considered perhaps a dispersed hoard perhaps a plowing but that's clearly not what's happened here and because of the anaerobic conditions, it's actually possible, um, some of the uh, material has actually survived in, uh, some of the organic material has survived in three of the spearheads. The um, wooden shafts that would have hafted the spearheads uh, survived enough to be dated. And uh, it was possible to get some radiocarbon dates that quite precisely dated the time in which um, the spearheads were probably in use or close to the point of deposition. We have to be aware that what we're dating is the wood, and so technically we're dating the hafting of the spearhead, but it gives us as archaeologists um, a broad idea of when these things were being um, deposited. And what's quite intriguing about this set of dates is they cover a really, really wide span. So you've got um, three spearheads with three separate dates, that sit across this time span within the late Bronze Age. And what's quite striking is that the probable um, time span over which date, uh, the, the probable time span that we retrieved from Spearhead 1 doesn't overlap with the time span that we got from Spearhead 3. So it suggests that there is uh, potentially sequential depositions happening in this area. Um, Alternatively, Spearhead 1 was already quite old when it was placed into this area at around the same time as the other, as the other spearheads, but um, we can start to think of this more as an accumulation of objects and perhaps even an accumulation of depositions with people revisiting the same places, place over long periods of time, successive generations, and casting these objects into a landscape um, that held importance to them. So, it gives, a, it gives a completely different spin on what would conventionally be a, a scrap hoard. Um, I focused on those two hoards, um, particularly because they're, they're two of the hoards that are going on display in the Kilmarta Museum redevelopment later this year. But there's also a range of other hoards from Argyle and Butte that are worth mentioning. And what you see on the left here is a gold bracelet from Isla. Um, one of 36 that was um, that was found around 1780, but most were melted down. And it's reported that the finder um, melted these bracelets down and turned them into handles for a drawer. So if anyone has a chest of drawers with gold handles at home, can you let me know? Because they might be the gold from this hoard. Um, the uh, the other hoard that you see on the right hand side from Isla is a bit of an unusual one. It's a collection of early, middle and late Bronze Age objects. It's what uh, would be referred to as a multi-period hoard. The earliest object is about a thousand years older than the latest object. It may be genuine or it's perhaps a more circumspect association, but we do know that 
during the Bronze Age, there were occasionally collections of objects that were much older um, being gathered and placed in a central location. Um, we've also got uh, this horde of spearheads, swords and axes from a site at Ballymore on the edge of Loch Fine, um, which was found while digging an ornamental pond. And, and it's probable that some of these objects were left complete. You know, you can see here that you've got quite com relatively complete swords. The damage on them is from corrosion and also a set of complete axe heads, but the spearheads have probably been deliberately fragmented partially. Uh, what's quite striking is the location that this was found at. Uh, Loch Fine leads out into the Firth of Clyde, which then leads to the Irish Sea. And Gordon Child speculated that the kind of form of some of these objects provided links with Ireland. And so perhaps these were objects being buried at the edge of a, a connecting route that led in from, um, from Northeast Ireland, across the Irish Sea into Southwest Scotland. And so in this way, we can start to see how the deposition of objects may actually tell us something about connections during this time. And uh, leading on from this, we've got um, we've got three swords that were um, found quite close together, point down in the peat on the Isle of Shuna. Um, you'll notice a running theme that a lot of this material is coming from watery locations, marshy areas, um, and th this is particularly prevalent in Scotland and Ireland, less so in southern southern Britain, but um, watery locations do recur again and again as a feature of Bronze Age depositions alongside the slightly higher places that you see, uh, for instance, with the Torren Horde. And it's interesting with something like the Shuna Horde because you've got three swords that were all thrust, uh, seemingly thrust point down in, into, into a watery location. And this is one of the few hordes that um, John Coles, who wrote um, kind of the, the the catalog of metalwork from from Scotland. This was one of the few hordes that he considered to be truly votive or ritualized in its in its deposition, because it's very hard to argue that three swords point down is is an accidental um, is an is an accidental loss or the stash of a, of a metalworker, for instance. But we have a range of of um, we have a range of depositions that seem to include this sort of structure to them and also a range of quite uh, significant objects. And you see one of those on your right here from near Campbelltown, found on two occasions, again, in a marshy location um, and including what is referred to as a flesh hook. And a flesh hook is uh, would have had a wooden shaft. You can see a, a replacement, a modern replacement um, for display purposes here. It would have had uh, a, um, a ferrule or a terminal end, and then this hook at the other end, which would have been used for hooking meat out of vessels. And I, there's an example of a vessel here on the on the bottom left found and, um, at Hatton Now in Peeblesshire. And the, the picture doesn't really do justice to this cauldron. This cauldron would have held about 40 to 50 litres of liquid. So it's very much a communal item and flesh hooks tie into this. And quite significantly, flesh hooks also tie into a much more Atlantic tradition. Uh, you see them in a wide variety of, uh, coming from a wide variety of locations and as far away as Iberia and parts of France. So again, you've got these objects tying into these, these broader networks um, and highlighting how communities uh, were able to procure these objects and presumably uh, share various ideological concepts as well. These, um, these hordes from our, uh, those hordes from Argyll and Butte, um, you know, represent the sorts of things that we're seeing um, uh, that we see from across Scotland at this time. You've got examples from um, examples from Sky Point of Sleet, as well as gold hoards. For instance, this one from Heights of Bray in um, former Ross and Cromarty, and a diverse collection of materials from Adderbrock on the Isle of Lewis. So, in this sense, the variety of hoards. 
that don't really com conform to a single picture within our Garland Butte is broadly representative of what else is happening in Scotland more widely. And a, a theme that I, I've I, I keep touching on is, is this idea of kind of deposits in relation to landscapes, these accumulations of objects. And it's worth exploring how how different objects are treated, are sometimes treated differently. And this appears to relate to the different landscapes in which they're buried. So um, to bring you uh, out of Argyll and Butte and across to, to Edinburgh, um, here we have uh, uh, an assemblage of weapons from Duddingston Lock in, North, uh, in, um, uh, in Edinburgh on the south side of Arthur's Seat. And it's a collection of about 50 spears and swords that have all been subjected to really extensive heating. And this has caused warping and bending and melting and some fragmentation. And it's, it's really just a, a really impressive collection of, of fragmented objects. Again, typically considered scrap, but as I mentioned for, um, for the coal uh, group of material, we may conceptualize performance associated with this in terms of gathering up this material and, and burning it um, and setting fire to it in ways that um, go beyond what was necessary for recycling, for instance, or go beyond what was necessary for, um, you know, scrap suggests worn out material, but this is anything but worn out. It's, been deliberately decommissioned. Um, it sits within a broader landscape of lots of late Bronze Age depositions, and these include things like swords and also um, uh, axe heads as well as spearheads. And Edinburgh has a quite an unusual density of, of hordes and yet no single finds within, within a, a relatively small geographic region. And the star on the um, the star on the, the map is, is starting to lock, but none of the objects show the same level of decommissioning that um, you see um, at Duddingston Lock. And so what you have is uh, the assemblage of weapons recovered um, and notably recovered from towards the center of the lock. So it's not slipped in at the edge of, of the lock. It's actually been uh, material must have been piled onto some sort of boat or vessel and actually moved out towards the center of the lock um, and thrown overboard essentially it's um it was found while dredging in uh in the 17 in 1778 so it's got quite a long history to it but it contrasts quite dramatically with what else has been deposited in and around arthur's seat and this um and this quite high landscape. So you can see uh, in the in the top left, I mentioned actually that there were no uh, very few single finds from the Edinburgh landscape. And actually the, the ax head in the top left is one of the very few found entirely by chance while someone was out walking uh, in and around the area. But you've also got two swords that were buried high up on the slopes overlooking Duddingston Lock found on a bed of charcoal, as well as to um, at least two socketed axes. There's reports that there might have been more, um, but only two survived today from um, near Salisbury Crab, Samson, uh, a plate area called Samson's Ribs. So quite prominent locations overlooking, and you'll see that in contrast with what was sunk into the waters of Duddingston Lock, these objects have been left pretty much completely intact. They show some signs of of use where in terms of uh, they might have been engaged in conflict, they were certainly prepared for use, sharpened, hammered, and were um, to all intents and purposes, very functional items. So their deposition suggests a very um, conscious decision to give up these very functional weapons and place them in quite prominent landscapes that contrasts quite, um, quite clearly with what was being placed into water um, within the same landscape. And we might see a relationship between the treatment of objects and also um, where they were being placed, which gives us some insights into how people conceptualized depositions as a kind of holistic practice that took in not only the objects, not only where, uh, where they were buried, but also how they were buried as well. And it extends beyond um, simply locks, 
uh, and marshes, we also get quite a lot of material that is uh, that derives from rivers. And predominantly, uh, swords and spears are the sorts of things that have, have been found through dredging and other activities in and around rivers, but you also get a wide um, range of tools, stone objects, and even human remains. Um, and what you see on the left here are three swords uh, that have been recovered from in and around the River Tay uh, in uh, uh, through Perth and Kim Ross. Um, and that's the picture on your right there. But we also, uh, this practice of placing things in rivers extends well beyond uh, Scotland and by far one of the largest densities of uh, metalwork recovered from a river in in certainly northwestern Europe comes from the River Thames, but you also see it in the River Trent, the River Severn, and in Ireland, the River Shannon, the River Corrib. And so you've got these um, quite main um, rivers that become the focal points for depositions. These are also the valleys in which there's lots of settlements um, being uncovered, lots of different structures, occasionally monuments. Um, so there seems to be um, this this focus on, on rivers. And one of the questions has been, why might this be? Um, and one of the suggestions is, um, one of the suggestions is that it, it ties into potential funerary practices. Uh, I've already mentioned that we don't have uh, very many human remains from uh, the late Bronze Age in, in Britain and Ireland. And so, uh, it's likely that whatever was happening with dead bodies, for instance, it doesn't leave an archaeological trace. And we might suspect something like cremation, where uh, um, the remains are being scattered, rather than a formal burial of a, of a person in a grave. And uh, this uh, limited evidence of, of burials makes it all the more striking when we, uh, when people have radiocarbon dated human remains from rivers, and found that they actually date to the late Bronze Age, suggesting perhaps that uh, perhaps that bodies were being placed in rivers. And here you see a, an, imagine, a, an imaginative um, funerary pyre um, where people uh, on the edge of the River Thames, people um, holding a ceremony and this person on the left holding up a sword uh, to be thrown into the river as part of the funerary rite. What I've presented so far is a lot of nice complete objects, um, a, a, a few uh, broken objects, but um, by no means uh, in, in some of these areas do you see kind of fragmentation as, as the dominant practice. Although you'll often hear late Bronze Age hoarding described in terms of the high levels of fragmentation. And the reason for this is because of the huge, huge volumes of broken up bits of metal that have been found, particularly in hordes of southern Britain. And these run into uh, these run from small accumulations of 10 to 20 objects right up to several hundreds. And in fact, the largest hoard in Britain is six and a half thousand fragments from a site called Islam in uh, Cambridgeshire. Um, and so that's kind of given, that's kind of sparked the general idea that most hordes are, are fragmentary in some way. And in reality, much of the fragmentation, much of the very densely fragmented objects that are typically considered scrap are quite well concentrated in um, southern England, uh, southeast England, and other, uh, and, and more broadly across southern Britain. The map you see is by no means um, uh, no means a comprehensive map of hordes. What it actually shows is uh, part of a tradition referred to as the carp's tongue tradition. This is named after a type of sword that commonly appears in hordes, um, which is one of these a uh, long blade and right at the end of it, um, it tapers into a point that apparently looks like a carp's tongue. Um, I can't say that I've been looking in the mouths of, of carps to know what this looked like, but somebody with an interest in swords and fish uh, must have named this at some point. Anyway, it ties into a broader tradition 
uh, across southeast England and northwestern France, where hordes were um, hordes had a particular character in not only being highly fragmentary but also very eclectic, with lots of quite diverse material, axes, swords, ornaments, and large numbers of ingots. Some complete, some broken, but showing very similar practices across the channel between southeastern England and kind of Atlantic France. And these hordes are generally deposited in lowlands, occasionally, in, uh, uh, often um, along river valleys towards coastlines. And it suggests this kind of connected practice spanning the area. Um, but we also have evidence that hordes that conform to a very similar character are um, are being found elsewhere as well. And so re most recently, there's been a cluster of hordes recovered through metal detecting that have come up from Cornwall. And here uh, is a group of material, uh, broken ingots, broken axes, fragmented buckles and, and, and uh, bits of blade that were recovered from St. Michael's Mount, which is this prominent tidal island off the south coast of, of Cornwall. It's a very evocative place. You can only access it at certain parts of the day. Uh, it's one of, uh, it's considered a landing point uh, for prehistoric and Roman times and uh, where people would have, uh, people would have landed in, in this area uh, from crossing the channel. And yet it ties into these, uh, this and a variety of hordes that have been found recently tie into this cross-channel um, network in a way that we we hadn't previously seen but the the style of the objects and the treatment of the objects certainly suggests this um, and even more so we're seeing this type of material cropping up in southwest wales and it's quite striking that actually we don't see this types of these types of material coming up um, elsewhere so much along the south coast you've got a very dense concentration in this uh, southern part of england on on the east side, and then suddenly a cluster in Cornwall uh, with one or two odd, odd instances. And it, and then again, you get it in South West Wales. And what it suggests is that whilst much of this material does look like worn out scrap, it looks like material that um, has been fragmented and just gathered and buried in, in, in a pit. It doesn't really strike any sort of particular, particular like ritualization for want of a better word it does once again tell us something about how this material was being moved and how communities were connected and recent metal detecting is in continually adding to that picture uh, by presenting some of this material coming up from um coming up via cornwall and southwest wales but it's important to note that fragmentation is not for everyone there are lots of lots and lots of hordes from Britain and Ireland, and entire and indeed entire areas of um, this this part of the world, where hordes were not fragmented before they were placed in the ground. So Northern Britain, for instance, doesn't have many fragmented uh, doesn't have that many fragmented hordes. Hordes you instead get collections of axes. Um, sometimes buried in high locations. And you've also seen a range of very complete swords uh, and, and other items that probably would be more commonly found fragmented further south. And similarly, in, uh, in Ireland, you also get uh, far more complete objects than you do incomplete objects. Um, I, this is a collection of items from Bully Bryan in County Clare, and it includes rings, axe, uh, uh, slightly broken axe heads, heads, as well as a pin and a fragment of a sword. And all of these items, albeit not necessarily complete items, they were all placed in this fantastic um, horn that you see on the left here. And this horn was uh, then wrapped in a goat skin and buried in in a bog and again it suggests what it suggests that is that even if these are dismantled objects or fragmented um fragmented bits of axes and swords 
should we be considering this scrap? There's been a deg certain degree of care attributed to this that we don't necessarily see elsewhere. Uh, we don't necessarily see in some of the other hordes that I, I presented to you from um, southern Britain. And then we also have some quite eclectic collections of material. Um, Ireland has some of uh, some of the most spectacular hordes of, um, of, of this period. Um, and uh, this one in particular, I, I really enjoy because it's it's a collection of not only gold objects, but also um, tin rings, boars tusks, bronze uh, bronze rings, bronze pins, bronze beads, and then all placed in a wooden box. And uh, it was recovered from the edge of a, a Cranog site. Again, a group of material gathered together, carefully placed into a vessel and um, sunk into a watery area. And indeed, much of the hordes from Ireland are retrieved from these watery locations. Perhaps the most spectacular, uh, uh, one of the most spectacular bronze hordes from from Ireland, and certainly one of the best best known, is this is this horde from Dowris, which uh, actually defines the late Bronze Age period in Ireland. It's commonly this period around 900 to 800 BC. It's referred to as as the Dowris period, and it, this comprised over to uh, around 200 objects. Uh, circumstances of its discovery are, aren't are very well known, but we know it was found at around, uh, around the 1820s is, and um, possibly um, linked with, with a lake area. And it's been suggested that this might actually be a, a, either a community deposit or a whole series of, uh, or a series of community projects uh, deposits added to over time and certainly radiocarbon dating of uh, a modern excavation of, of hordes like coal or you know, assemblages like coal add to this idea that we may not be may not necessarily need to think of hordes as closed deposits but actually accumulations that were fed into over long periods of time uh, you know you can see from this list of objects five swords 44 spearheads 43 axes 48 crotals, which are these little kind of music bells, as, um, as well as 28 horns. This is not the wares of, of a single individual or perhaps even a single person, a, a single community. You know, this is might represent the coming together of lots of different people over long periods of time revisiting the same area. By far, um, Ireland is known for it's late Bronze Age gold at this time. Um, we find gold, hordes of gold objects in lots of locations across uh, Northwestern Europe. There's smatterings of them across, um, across uh, Britain, but the quantity and the quality of material that comes out of Ireland at this time is just remarkable. And here um, I have a hoard from County Clare of at least 146 ornaments that um were found um packed into a, a cavity possibly in a wet area again this recurrence of wet areas um between two locks and um much of it was unfortunately melted down upon discovery you can see here that uh what you see here are mostly replicas to give an indication of the scale of the hoard but in total this would have been more than six kilos of gold you know you we often think of um, some gold objects communicating identity status. Maybe a powerful figure would have been able to wear one or two, but 146 ornaments goes so far beyond what one person would need to wear or even multiple chiefs or chieftains would be capable of wearing. Um, it's, uh, it, it says something very different about what what and how this, this wealth was being sacrificed. Um, and, and placed into the ground. Um, it suggests again, the coming together of lots of different people, but all conforming to the same idea. You also need people to subscribe to this idea of deposition, of giving up these objects, that giving up these objects means so much that they're better off in the ground than they are in your, in your care. It's been suggested that this might be a, a hoard for safekeeping, 
but again the volume of items is 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 such that it it strikes me as far more intentional and, and permanent than a temporary store of, of material and here's another view of it that shows not only the bracelets that were buried but also a series of of neck rings um, it really is quite a quite a spectacular um, collection we uh, the whilst a lot of material comes from um uh, comes from wet areas in in Ireland you also get the same recurrence of uh, situations that you see in, in particularly Scotland and other parts of of um, Britain where material is getting deposited in rocky outcrops and high places um, what you've got here is a single fine uh, from Glenasheen in um, County Clare and this is what's referred to as a gorget you only find these in um, in Ireland, these are really impressive um, neck ornaments and, um, made uh, with exquisite craftsmanship. And this one was in fact um, found while chasing a rabbit. Rabbit went and hid in a, a, a rock cavity, a fissure of a rock. And um, when uh, the person went to go get the rabbit, he noticed this object uh, embedded in there. But in fact, this object was folded in half it, and it's since been straightened out for display purposes. Again, it suggests um, an intriguing treatment of of objects that um, that, that kind of defies a rational explanation. You know, folding one of these in half is almost a, a an act of of decommissioning, of taking this out of use, of a deliberate act as well. I've shown you some quite spectacular finds of gold, but um, often these are relatively small groups and we can envisage these as much more community deposits or um or the the own ownership of one person uh, or, or one community um but i've also mentioned for instance the slightly larger ones uh, that we know about from historical records such as the one from isla of 36 um, gold bracelets and whilst these suggest uh, quite purposeful sacrifice it's um we do also have a range of hoards that really throws into question our interpretations of what is considered scrap and what is considered um, sacrifice. So here is a collection of material found while metal detecting in 2017 from the south coast of Devon. Um, it comprises four folded gold bracelets and a collection of ingots and broken axes and swords. And if you found the bracelets together, we would generally consider that some sort of personal or votive offering. If we found all the ingots um, in a in a place together, we would consider that some sort of scrap or, or abandoned a set of abandoned material. What does it mean when we find both together? What does that tell us about why and how these things are being buried? Is it our modern conceptions that this broken up bit these broken up bits of ingots and axes and swords seem valueless to us, but may have actually had some sort of greater value in the Bronze Age that we're not recognizing. And this isn't um, this isn't just a one off. Here we have two hordes from North Wales, the horde on the left from Angles. See from Kim Cadman uh, includes gold ring. Uh, an ornament perhaps for the ear or maybe even the nose alongside some fragments of ingot and a, a curious um, short blade um, that's broken in half alongside a complete axe head that has fragments of gold bar placed into the socket so in this case the gold is fragmented but the objects are left relative the bronze objects are left relatively in um, intact so i'm conscious of time um, and so start bringing this towards a a conclusion um i think hopefully what i've shown is that we need to be moving away from a fairly kind of simplistic um and long outdated interpretations of this of this material or and start to consider the range of elements that we can derive from analyzing um analyzing the hordes themselves, the individual objects, the landscapes, it's um, seeking patterns in the data, and all the different ways in which 
this material must have been brought together to go into the ground at a certain point in time or a successive series of points in time that tells us a little bit about um, the scale and involvement of communities, aspects of identities that might have been involved. Of, um, for instance, where we see Irish style metalwork does that uh, or, or, um, or cross channel forms of, of uh, deposition, does that tell us something about the types of people who were doing this and the sorts of um, the sorts of connections that those people have? And it adds a much richer picture to to our understanding of all these different things um, that goes beyond is this is this um, the owned by one person or is this a metal workers hoard or so on um, and we end up in a situation where we have a widespread idea that placing objects in the ground is the thing to do it fits in whatever the belief systems were at this time. And we have to be honest in saying that we're dealing with pre-literate societies. So we're never going to know exactly all the intricacies of religion and ritual that are happening at this time. But one thing that seems integral to the manifesting beliefs is burying objects. And this seems to tie into the wider picture that's happening not just in Britain, not just in Ireland, but across Europe at this time. Um, and people are taking these broad ideas and they're doing them in very specific ways that reflect individual connections and social relations. And by social relations, I mean not just um, with between individuals, but also between um, communities, between people and objects and people and places, um, and also uh, wider ideas that they may be connected with. So when we come to this question of are we looking at sacrifices of material or are we looking at scrap material, I think uh, in many cases we may be looking at both or neither or um, uh, uh, and I, th I think a far more interesting angle is to is to think beyond this kind of dichotomy and consider that these are expressions of of beliefs if um, even if that belief is you should abandon the material or that belief is you should thrust swords into water relocations um, it it adds a lot of nuance to our understanding of of uh, people at this time and how they were all connected um, and it's these sorts of things that that really help us understand meaning to, to bronze age communities so I'm going to end on that point. Um, thank you all so much for listening. Um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was so interesting. I, I really enjoyed that. I'm especially taken by when you went to Shuna because I used to live on Shuna mm. many years ago. Wow. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, so seeing them in the museum was fantastic for mm. me when I was there. We, we, we've had we've had a few questions mm -hmm. from the start, and um, I know that Patrick Mackey had something. Patrick, do you want to come in? That you talked about about the um, the Turin in Ford. If you're not there, Patrick, I can say it for you. Um, no, Patrick just wanted to let us know that that where whereabouts the um, the find was, mm -hmm. they've actually started to fell that area again oh have so they lots of the crags are exposed at the moment so oh uh, that's good to know yes yeah, so it, it's an area that's managed by the forestry commission and when i've been there before it's it's completely covered and fairly inaccessible but uh that's interesting to know i have tried to get up there before but yeah just well, not possible well when you come and visit us it might be a good a good chance to come up oh, and have a excellent look. yeah no, that, that was great that was the first one and the second one was linda merrill Linda, do you want to mention your question or shall I read it for you? It's Linda there. Um, Linda is um, saying that in Millam, southwest Cumbria, a local metal detectorist found a small horde of five Bronze Age axe heads, which mm. was extremely rare in the area. Mm. So it's quite a recent find, I think. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, that's the obviously trying to cover all of Britain and Ireland, there, there end up being being gaps, but 
um, one of the things I, I didn't mention so much is, is you do have regions where hoarding is just pretty absent altogether and Cumbria is one of those on those areas so it's always quite striking when stuff does come up because it yeah it it gives you a very you know a very specific snapshot of a particular time yeah. Um, which yeah yep. and John no it was John Rosenfield do you want to say John, you're there, I can see you, but I don't know if you want to unmute and just, you, you were mentioning something about a log boat. Um, yes, I work, I, I am from BAFN, the British Association of Friends of Museums. Mm. And when I visited Perth, it was the Carpo long boat that was buried in the silt of the mm -hmm. Tay River, um, preserved by the, the silt. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if that dates from the same time or mm. not. Yes, it does. It does. Uh, yeah, that's a it's an incredibly remarkable, remarkable find of this um, hollowed out, um, hollowed out log boat that would have been used to travel up and down the River Tay um, uh, three thousand years ago. Um, yeah, it's currently under it's currently under uh, conservation work, but that's a they'll be going back on display in Perth Museum in uh, I think next year. So um, yeah, no. If you if you can get out and see it, it's it's quite incredible. There's a there's a fair number of late Bronze Age boats from around um, from around Britain and Ireland, and yeah, they 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 again they add another element to the idea that people are moving around. And you see some of these things, and you think I would not want to get into that and get on get on a river. And some of the things you see that they use to cross the cross the channel are just yeah phenomenal. Um, it it's yeah, it's quite striking. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, with our with the weather that we have in some places, mm. you can imagine the challenges from there. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a, I'm a keen kayaker, and there there are some days I'm just not going to go out there. <laughs> I know, and it, I mean, you see, you know, people are are crossing a place like the Minch and and out to the Outer Amazing. Hebrides, and you you know, in in a hollowed out canoe, basically, and you think. You know, it's I barely amazing. want to do that in a regular boat. <laughs> no, it's really impressive, isn't it? Yeah. And there was a, a really interesting question as well from Richard Willander as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to ask it, Richard, or do you want me to say? Are you there, Richard? Oh, you're there. Uh, well, thanks, Jacqueline. Matt, thanks very much indeed. That was a fascinating talk. Um, no, I just wanted to know um, if there was, how, how are the, uh, how is the, bronze work fragmented hmm. physically is it is it cut is it hammered is it, and um and is is there anything significant in that uh yeah i it, it's that's a really really good question um it's basically what i did my phd on um oh, <laughs> which, which is <laughs> so that's very very uh, uh it's a really good question uh it's basically um you often see bits of metalwork that have hammer blows or chisel marks on them. And um, that's been suggested to be the way that these things are fragmented. Um, that's broadly true, but because of the nature of the bronze alloy, um, it, you have to heat it first. And when you heat it, um, the bronze goes quite brittle. You have to heat it to about five or 600 degrees. And then at that point, it basically becomes so brittle that no matter the object, it could be an axe, it can be a spear, it can be a sword, um, the blunt impact of a hammer blow will, will cause it to snap. Um, and you can use a chisel for this. Um, and in my experience, you don't need a chisel. You just need to have got it to the right temperature and be really confident with your strike. Um, I did this with a series of replicas. And I found the only times I left chisel marks was when I got it wrong. So the only the failed strikes are the ones that did are the ones that leave chisel marks and the way you, when I got it absolutely right and split the sword, it it left no chisel marks whatsoever. What this tells us is that the people who are fragmenting the metal work have a material knowledge, um, which so one of the suggestions is whether or not metal workers are involved in some way in these really fragmented hordes, and if we know that this material is being heated up. And then, and then, kind of cut into lots of segments, fragmented in lots of different ways, is um, it suggests to us that even if a metal worker wasn't involved, someone with material knowledge must have been. 
Mm -hmm. um, you see some patterns in fragmentation, but what's more curious is when you see bits that have been broken by people who clearly didn't know what they were doing. So you occasionally see really, really heavily hammered bits or loads and loads of chisel marks. And it suggests that somebody who knew that they should break something up, but they didn't know how to do it, was, was trying to undertake this practice. Um, I've yet to find any patterns in fragmentation by like region or anything like that. It seems there's only so many ways you can break up a sword and everyone does it about the same way. And this is often closely related to crucible size and what you could put, the, how small the metal needed to be to go into a crucible. And that's usually about five, yeah, four to five centimeters. Um, but bigger than that, you'll start to get into, you know, you'll start to wonder why they're breaking it up like that. But it's a really good question and I could give a whole new presentation on it. <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I'll make a note of that. <laughs> Well, one of your earlier slides showed, um, you showed, I hadn't come across it before, um, a hafted chisel, you described oh, yes. it as a hafted chisel? Yes. Well, do you think that was an object, uh, uh, an implement to help breaking, uh, to break up some of the... Yeah, potentially. I, th I think it's, we have, so you'll have seen that a lot of what I showed were axes and swords and things mm -hmm. like that. And the reason for that is that we have a disproportionate amount of those in the our, in, in our hordes and in in deposits so you have got evidence of small tools but some of something like a bronze chisel for instance it could be used for um it could be used for leather working it could be used for fine woodworking it could also be used for chopping up bronze it's probably one of these very multifunctional tools yeah. but yeah. something like that chisel could easily be used to break up bronze but uh, for instance we don't have we don't have many hammers but we know they must have been hammering all this stuff either for working it or for breaking it up. But we have only a handful of them from, from Britain. It's quite, um, yeah, there is a dis disconnect between the tools they must have had and the tools we ne that now survive. Yeah. So. Fascinating stuff. I think yeah. I've had my time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Thank you. And then when you were talking about the um, the gold holes that were found mm. in, in Ireland, there's a there was a something there from Sheila about mm. an archaeologist, Henry Sleeman. Um, <laughs> I think well <laughs> uh, the, the man the man who went through Troy. The um. man who went through Troy, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. And then we've also got a wee comment from a, a question from Joan Patterson. Mm. Um, Joan, are you there? Do you want to ask about your you there, Joan, or do you want me to ask? Um, question from Joan was um, where the gold was being sourced from. Mm -hmm. Actually, that was something I was wondering. Are yeah. there local quarries or do you think they've been trading it? So what, what, what are your views on it? Uh, it's a fantastic question. Um, I don't know the answer, but the work hasn't been done on it. Uh, we know, so we know that uh, Whilst Scotland has natural deposits of gold, we have no evidence that any of that has been exploited in, from as early as the Bronze Age. We know that sources of big sources of gold in, in um, Cornwall and Ireland were being exploited. Um, the Cornish gold sources seem to generally be linked with tin. And there's very, very I mean, tin is an interesting one because there's very, very few places in Western Europe where there are deposits of tin. And someone once told me that Cornwall has the largest depo natural deposit of tin from here to Afghanistan or something like that. Something quite, quite striking. But there are other sources in um, Iberia and Germany. When it comes, so the reason that's important is because if you're exploit it, already exploiting tin from Cornwall, you're probably also exploiting gold. But um, at the same time, copper is being extracted from Wales and also Ireland. And these are also big sources of gold as well. So it's quite difficult to provenance gold. And there's um, there's various bits of work being done currently to try and narrow this down. Uh, but our best guess is is these in for Britain and Ireland, it's Cornwall and um, Cornwall and Ireland that uh, like South um, West Ireland um, that these are coming from. But it's um, yeah, it's a question that remains to be answered. And as to the provenance of Scottish gold, we, we really don't know. We really haven't answered that question yet. So, right. 
And I'll, I'll be looking at the handles of drawers that I see yes. very closely. <laughs> yeah, one thing that struck me going through uh, how these hordes were discovered is how many have quirky stories attached to them. You know, mm -hmm. someone chasing a rabbit or a ferret or melting everything down and making drawer handles. So. I know. I know it's great, isn't it? Sometimes yeah. it's things like playing marbles with yeah. things and then realising there's something very exciting there. Yeah. But uh, no, it's great. It's really good. I think I think that's all the, the questions now, um, Matthew, but thank you. That, that I really, really enjoyed that. That's been super. Thank so you. Thank you very much for talking to us. Well, thank you very and, much for having me. And I'm looking forward to coming back to the museum and having a good look around in my next visit to Edinburgh. Mm. So Yeah, you're very uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Um, as, a, as I've said before, this is being recorded. So if you want to watch anything back at all, it should be out in, after um, Aaron Watson, our expert, has um, had a look through it and edited it all. So it should be available on our YouTube channel, along with all our other talks that we've had as well. Um, and just to say that the next talk that we've got is on the 16th of March, and it is Talking Torques, South to North or North to South, with uh, Dr. Tess Machling as well. So um, I hope I've pronounced that right. But on behalf of Camart Museum, thank you again, everybody. It's been fantastic having you from all over the world again. Um, I've really enjoyed this evening. So thank you again, Ma Matthew. Thank you, Matt. And, and it's all coming up. Excellent talk, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank so that's been brilliant. Yes. So thank you and good night, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Yeah.